Welcome everyone that's come by now. Uh, this is the second technical workshop of the Internet Computer Hackathon. We'll get started in a minute or two. We'll let Hamish settle in. So just to get over the basics. So this is the second technical event. So far we have had one technical workshops and two introductory lessons. One was an intro to Internet Computer and one was a hackathon information event. If you, ha if you have missed these, you can find them on our Medium uh, profile and also on our YouTube where you will find all the relevant links and signups and forms, which my colleague Omji will also link in the chat. Uh, one most important date to remember is the submissions date for the hackathon. It's on Sunday, the 31st of October. It's Halloween, very easy to remember. So if you're planning on submitting your project, remember to submit it then. We will also post a challenges article as well as a submissions guide guiding you through the whole submissions process. So make sure you don't miss any of these. Uh, you will submit your projects via Google form, which will also be posted in all the relevant Discord channels on our Twitter and Medium articles. So if you have any questions about the submissions process, feel free to ping us on Discord or on our, on our emails or DM us on Twitter. So now we can get on to the technical part, which I'm sure you're all waiting for. So Hamish, if you're ready, I'll let you share your screen and... Okay. Um, okay, so yeah, my name's Hamish. I um, primarily work on building an app called OpenChat which um, runs on the internet computer. New version coming soon. I don't know if, if ever, any of you have used the currently live version, but our plan is to have a new version out in a, a month or so. That will be a nice improvement. Um, but in this talk, I'm just going to show how to build a really basic, um, pretty much the most basic app you could build, just a to-do list, um, which hopefully will prove provide a good starting point for you in your hackathon, um, I will share screen. So did I share the right screen? You're, you're seeing my, um, the okay. DFX JSON, right? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so I've just got a pretty much empty project here. So I've just got git ignore an empty workspace. I've got just a default DFX JSON, but we'll add to that in a sec. And I've got this script that I always use for generating the, um, wasms basically building your code into a wasm which we'll use later so um for this i'm using c lion which is the JetBrains ide but you can use any ide that works with rust i guess visual studio code is probably a very popular one because it's completely free c lion is free for a demo but you have to pay if you want to use it for longer than something like 30 days anyway it will be the same either way whichever one you're using, as long as it's got good Rust integration. So let's start by building a, uh, by creating a new package. So we're just going to call it to do, and it's a library. Okay, so that's got it here. Um, first thing you probably want to do when you're building services is to um, define your candid file. So let's go ahead and do that. I'm also, I'm kind of assuming that you have Rust knowledge here. I'm not really gonna go too much into the Rust details. I'm more gonna look at building on the internet computer given that you have Rust knowledge. So let's create a candid file. And this is a to-do list service. So actually I'm gonna pull out one that I did earlier because I'm not going to remember the syntax properly. Okay. So we're going to want to be able to add and let's just keep it simple. It will take some text and then that will return an ID. So let's call that a NAT32. You're also going to want to be able to get them and that will return a VEC of, I haven't done that right, a VEC of uh, let's just call it text for now. And that's a query. Um, yeah, you can look up the candid schema. There's, um, if you Google it, you'll be able to find the documentation on how exactly to build a candid file if you're not familiar with them. And then we're also going to want markers done. And that will take the ID that we got back from here. 
and return let's just say it returns a true or false hey hamish we have a question in the chat um so the question is how can you call an arbitrary canister with just its principle the import binding thing is cool but i'm wondering about calling other external canisters from dfx or within a canister so from dfx you can say dfx canister call canister call and then i think you can just input the principle the person is clarifying um within a canister okay uh I wasn't going to cover that in this example because it's just we don't have too much time, but I'll send over some examples of where you can do that. Um, so, yeah, let's just carry on with this. So here is the candid file and then we've got our lib where we will start building the logic. So um, for building canisters in Rust, you often need, well, in fact, you almost always need some global state and that is very easy to do in Matoko, but it's not very easy in Rust. The SDK does expose a method. In fact, let's add a reference to ICE CDK, whatever the latest one is. Um, and we're going to want ICE CDK. Ah, we need ICE CDK macros. Is it going to pick it up? I think it's that. Yes. So we're going to want ICCDK macros. And let's just import all of them. And so what this allows us to do is we can define our queries and our updates and also go back and fix your typos. Um, so let's define go back to the candid file we've got add so let's define add first so add is going to be an update call and it takes um let's call it a name which will be a string and it returns a nat32 in candid which in rust is a u32 so what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to take this name and put it into some global state and so there's a good talk by one of the Definity devs called Roman, where he talks about the various ways of doing global state. But essentially, the best way that pretty much the Rust experts, which isn't me, uh, have decided on is to use thread local and then have a static um, I'll call it runtime state. So this is what I'm calling the variable name and the type is a ref cell of, and then the type is runtime state. Now, the reason for all of this, it looks a bit crazy. And to be honest, it, it is a bit crazy, um, is because um, in order to have things um, persist, well, to have global state, essentially, there are a few various ways of doing it. And this way, um, there's no unsafe code involved. If you use the um, storage API from the Rust CDK, there's actually some ways where you can kind of shoot yourself in the foot because it uses some unsafe code under the hood that you can get a reference to something and then do something asynchronous and then still have a reference to the original thing and it can go wrong um watch i'd really recommend watching roman's talk for a much better explanation of exactly why it goes wrong but i'll show you how you can use it how you can use this mechanism and i think i would really recommend using this this way so if we need to import ref cell uh, and so ref cell essentially um it, it has a, it enables a thing called interior mute, is it interior mutability? Essentially, you can, rather than having to do the checks at build time, ref cell allows you to um, do the, for the borrow checker to do its checks at runtime. 
so I'll, I'll kind of show you what that enables you to do in a sec. So um, what we want to do is we want to put all of our data into this runtime state object. So let's define a struct runtime state. And we're also going to put more than just data in here essentially, uh, eventually. But with, for now, let's just have the data. So we'll define the data as well. And in our case, we want to have a list of to-dos. So let's just call it to-dos. And that can be a vec of to-do to -do item. Um, let's ignore that. In fact, I'll turn off Slack. OK. Um, OK, so we need to define the to-do item. And so let's give it a name, which will be a string um done boolean and an id um okay so if we want to add a new item what we first need to do let's close this button a bit what we first need to do is we need to acquire access to this global state and the way you do that is using this with function. And then what you do is you pass a closure into the with function. <clears throat> and what this will do is it will acquire a reference to the state and allow you to access it within the closure, but then it doesn't allow any access outside of the closure. So if you want any, um, any values from inside, you're gonna need to clone them or yeah, essentially you're gonna need to clone them or if they implement copy, then you don't need to because it will do it for you. Um, so in here, what you can do is you can say state.borrow and this will now have access to the inner runtime state. And um, when you're using this thread local, it probably looks a bit weird reading it, but on the internet computer, canisters are all th single threaded. So you don't really need to worry about the fact that, that it's thread local. as in you'll always get access to the same one because it's always the same one thread doing the processing. And so how this works is the first time any thread accesses the variable, it will be initialized for that thread to the default value you pass in here. So in order for this to work, we're gonna need to give this a default value. If ever your runtime state type doesn't have a default value, what you can do is you can wrap this in an option, but then every time you use it, you have to do an unwrap, which is quite annoying. Oh, I've just seen there's loads of messages that I'm ignoring. Um, Liz, do you want to just shout out if there are any questions I should pause and take note of, but otherwise I'm not really going to be looking. Yeah, yeah, uh, no worries. So let's see, somebody is saying, what are the data types in Rust? uh i think i mean that's probably more a question for somewhere else because if i think if i start diving into all that we'll run out of time before we've got anything done oh, i've just seen the question come in what id would you recommend i really enjoy using sea lion i think it works really well but i think you have to pay for it i'm, I'm paying something like a hundred pounds a hundred dollars for americans um i don't know what country you guys are all based in um, um, about a hundred pounds a year. VS Code, yeah, VS Code is quite good. Yeah, um, it does. C line does do debugging. Um, so, um, the way I've always implemented this, which it allows for really easy testing, is to have a for each um, publicly exposed API, like for every query and update. I have a corresponding um, oh, look, open chat notifications. They're working. Uh, I have a corresponding function that is very easy to test and which just is, is a pure function that just takes the input argument and also the runtime state as parameters. So in, that, in this example, it would be runtime state, which needs to be a mutable reference to the runtime state. And this returns the ID. 
And so in here, what we'll do is we'll say runtime state dot data dot to do's push. And then we need to build a to do item. So name, why is that not scrolling down? My computer's going weird. So name is fine, done. Let's put that to false. Now ID, um, what we could do is just give it the index. Yeah, let's just give it give it the index. So we can say um, let index, no, let ID equal runtime state dot data dot to do's dot length. And so as we add each, that's that comes back as a U size. So let's just turn that to U32. And then we need to return the ID to keep the return type happy. So now in this first function, we acquire a reference onto this global state. And then what we want to do is we want to call this add implementation with the name and a mutable reference to that state. And so that is our first function all done. And the reason I've split it into two is because this in isolation is really hard to test. Whereas this one, when you're writing a test, you can just pass in the name and any instance of the runtime state that you can just build up during your test and you can test this. And you know, that this is so minimal, this function, that you don't really need to test this one. As long as you've tested this one, which contains all your logic, you're all good. Hey, Hamish. Um, we have a couple of questions in the chat. So first question um, is, why are you not using the tree set like in the example in this like linked GitHub? And um, secondly, could you clarify like what part of this is a smart contract like where does that all come to play with the ic yeah i think i've been assuming at least some basic slash intermediate knowledge of internet computer maybe i should take a step back so what i'm building here is a canister and so i'm writing the rust code which we will then compile into wasm which we <clears throat> can then deploy onto a canister so what we can do is let's do a DFX build. No canisters in the configuration file. OK. So this is kind of the most minimal DFX JSON you can get. It defines the networks, which is local, and the IC. I think that's normally called mainnet now. So what we need to add in here is canisters. And I'm not going to write this myself. I'm going to copy one I made earlier. But essentially what we're building here is a service that will run in a single canister where we can add to-do items and query to-do items and mark them as done. <laughs> and so that, that canister itself is a smart contract running on the internet computer, obviously. I'm just trying to find the DFX JSON file that I made prior to this stream. And I've got it. OK, so in this canisters field, in our simple example, there's just a single canister. It's called to do. But you could have as many as you want. You could have you know, another one called, like, called that, and another one, another one, and so on. And because we're building it as a Rust canister, you need to put type as custom. And when you say type custom, you have to say where your WASM is. And so in our case, we're going to be building the WASM using this script, which will put the WASM into this directory. And so um, what happens when you do a DFX deploy is it will run the build and then it will push this WASM. It will install this WASM into the canister. So in fact, let's, let's try that. Cannot find canister ID. That's a nice error message because we can just copy out the command to run there. Ah, okay, I need to run DFX locally. So let's go into dev, what does I call this, to do? 
and then dfx start so what this has done is this is now running a local instance of the internet computer which we can dev against so i'll just put that to the side so now when i do dfx canister create to do <clears throat> this will create an empty canister on that locally running replica on that locally running internet computer replica so it's just creating that canister uh, it took a bit slower than it could have done because it went via a wallet canister you can actually skip that but let's not go into that so um so now i can do a dfx build to do did not match any packages why to do that's why i haven't added it to the workspace so members so by using a workspace if you have multiple canisters each canister can be in its own package and you can add each of them in here if you're doing a simple example then you probably um yeah open chat will be open source in once we go live with the next version hopefully a month we'll see um so now that we've added this package into the workspace when we run a dfx build it should now build properly provided i haven't made any other stupid mistakes um i see cdk i haven't referenced it properly so no it was in here this should be i see cdk with a dash that is one thing that's quite annoying about rust you always have mismatches between underscores and dashes anyway let's try that again okay so that is building so um let's do while it's building let's implement a get function and so a get is a query so say get and let's just return all of them so it will return a vec of to do item so in order to return to do item to do item needs to implement a trait called candid type because if it doesn't implement that trait then we're not going to be able to serialize this using candid in the response because it's one thing being able to represent the data in rust in memory i've done something wrong there oh no no that's just a bit i'm in the middle of building um it's one thing representing the object in memory but in order to return it to someone calling from the outside you need to turn that object into a stream of bytes and so in order to do that we need it to be candid serializable so what you can do is you can just say derive candid type but that is another reference we're going to need to add in here so candid also i've got i'll post a link to this repo after the actually i'll post a link now i've got it up on another tab if anyone wants to follow along that's the repo um so we've got candid type so we need to import that so that it will actually be picked up so we've defined get and again let's use this same pattern so we'll have a corresponding get implementation which will take well no arguments other than the state and this will return a vec of to do item and so in this case we just say runtime state data to do's and we need to clone them because of the borrow checker we can't return a reference to them because um essentially we will outlive the reference that we're holding onto this global state so we need to return owned properties rather than references and so we need to clone the whole vec and then when we call into that we say runtime state with so this is acquiring the reference and we'd say state get state borrow i think that's it what's wrong with that okay so that is add and get and so let's try calling one of these so now uh let's actually let's try building again because it didn't build the last time 
build step failed. So borrow we can get rid of, apparently. To do's clone. Ah, so what we need to do is we need to allow the to do type to be cloned. So if we just derive the clone attribute, the clone trait, that should now work. Cannot borrow as mutable line 28. Ah, whoops. So when you borrow from this state, you need to say if you want to borrow an immutable or a mutable reference. That's just um, a Rust thing. No such file or directory. Post build step failed. I think that's normally when the candid file can't be found. To do can dot did. That is there. Target wasm thirty two unknown. Target wasm thirty two release. To do wasm. Why is it not there? Ah, yes, I missed something. Um, in order to compile to wasm, you need to include um, a little field in the cargo toml. Um, oh, I've just seen someone ask, can you show how to set up a test? Yes, I will hopefully get onto that. Um, you need to include this in your cargo toml in order for it to be compiled to wasm. This is um, for it to be a dynamic library. I remember reading into why exactly you need this, but this was about eight months ago and I can't remember anymore. I just know that you need to put this in, otherwise it won't compile to wasm. So let's let's try that again. Uh, to do dot did. Ah, that should have been in brackets. Okay, so we've built it. So let's try doing a deploy. So what this is going to do is it's going to um, turn the Rust code I've just built into a WASM. And then it's going to install that WASM here. You can see installing code for canister. It's going to install that onto the locally running internet computer re replica instance that I've got running here. Okay, that's done. So now what we can do is we can say DFX canister call to do. And then the method we want to call is let, let's call get first. So if we call it with no args, I've done something wrong. Uh, candid get. Uh, it doesn't return vector text, it returns. Okay, so we're going to need to re define the type to do item, I think I called it. And that had an ID, it had a name, and it had done. And so get returns that. I think I need to do another deploy again. No, okay, cool. So it, I don't need to do a deploy if you just update the candid file, of course, yeah. Um, so you see it's returned an empty list. So now, what if we do add, and let's call it um, pick up food. <laughs> Uh, so you see this request is taking a bit longer and that is because that was an update request. And so an update request, if you're not familiar with the internet computer yet, a query is really fast. It doesn't mutate state. An update is slower because it has to go through consensus among all of the nodes in a subnet. And only once it's gone to all of them um, and processed by all of them, and put into a, a block, it um, all of those replicas will then process the block. And only after that happens do you get a response. Whereas a query can be handled by any replica and it can just handle it immediately. There's no queuing or anything like that. So if ever you're not modifying state, you want to specify in your candid file that it's a query because it'll just make the whole thing much quicker. So if, if we see the get call now, 
it returns an item straight away. You know, this is this is just as quick as if you're um, hitting a normal website that's not running on the internet computer. And this, this is one of the really good things about the internet computer is that you can serve up responses really fast um, if they don't modify state. So let's do another deploy and I'll explain why in a sec. So if we do another DFX deploy is already installed. Okay, so it doesn't do it unless um, I just need to change anything really. Let's just say ID is length. Uh, ID plus one, is that gonna be happy? Just so that it the deploy actually goes through. So it did the build, it's upgrading the code. Okay, and that's done. So if we do get again now, you'll see it's returned nothing. And it's returned nothing because this state isn't being persisted between the upgrades. And so that's something we need to handle now. So let's do that. So in order to have your state persist between upgrades, what you need to do is you need to use the pre-upgrade and the post-upgrade hooks. So in pre-upgrade, what you need to do is serialize your data and then save it to what's called stable memory. And stable memory is memory that lives outside of your canister and it's persisted between the canister upgrades. So I'll show you what I mean by that. Um, so in order to serialize the state, we first need to get a reference to the state. And then in the CDK, so I see CDK, there's a storage API and we can say stable save. And what this will do is it will save anything inside the that you pass in as args to stable memory. And so what we want to save is state, we need to borrow it, and then the data. We want to just save all of our data um, into stable memory. And this returns a result. And so we need to just unwrap that. We're just going to assume it will be valid. So we'll just unwrap it. You could probably handle this nicer if you were doing this for real. Um, so yeah. And then the semicolon. And then in the post upgrade, we essentially want to do the opposite. So in the post upgrade, this time we want to get the data out. So we'd say let data equals IC CDK storage stable restore unwrap but by just writing this um the compiler can't work out what type we need so what we want to do is we just need to define that as data type and then this time we need to take a reference onto the global state but then assign it to be this new data type that we've just um, deserialized out of the state so here we will say state borrow mute so we're getting a mutable reference to the state and we just say equals data but we need to dereference that pointer ah whoops okay so one other thing that's a bit weird is um, when you do stable save, you have to pass in tuples. You can't just pass in single values. So what we can do is we can pass in a single value tuple. And the syntax for doing that is as, as follows. It's kind of you surround it with brackets and just put a comma, which is, is really weird. But um, 
that's what you have to do. That has tripped up quite a few people before. Um, and also, because we're saving this data, this type into stable memory, it needs to both be able to be serialized and deserialized. So what that means is we're going to need to add candid type onto this and also deserialize onto this. And deserialize is from the CERD or CERD A. I've heard some people call it CERD and I've heard others call it CERD A. I'm not sure. And so use CERD deserialize. So now in the pre upgrade, we get our reference onto the global state and we then save it to stable memory. And internally, this will be serializing it. And it only works because this implements candid type. And then in post upgrade, we read from stable memory. And actually, again, we need to do the same thing. We need to say data, because again, it, it only works with tuples. So you need to do it like this. So in this case, it will read the bytes from stable memory, and then it will deserialize it onto the type that we pass in here. And then exactly the inverse of here, we acquire a reference, but this time a mutable reference onto the global state, and then set its value to be the runtime state that we literally just deserialized. So let's try this now. So if we do DFX deploy, Deserialize. Ah, okay. So in order for the data to be able to implement deserialized, everything inside data must also implement deserialized. So let's just add deserialized trait onto the to do item. And it's candid type and deserialized are already implemented for U32 string and Boolean. They're just primitive types. Oh, I've just seen an error. Panic to result unwrap. Okay, I realize what that is. That is because post upgrade, this is going to fail because in the current version, there is nothing in here. So let's just comment. It's kind of cheat. Let's comment out the post upgrade. <clears throat> then this should work, this upgrade. provided I haven't done anything else wrong. Okay, good, that worked. And then let's undo that. And now let's deploy again, because now when it does this deploy, before the upgrade happens, it will run this one, which will serialize the state into stable memory. And so that will allow the post upgrade to this time work. Okay, that's deployed. So let's try doing DFX canister call um, to do add uh, hang up laundry in case anyone forgot to do that. I did mine earlier. You can see it there. Nice and nice and hung up. Um, okay, so now if we do DFX canister call to do get. So you can see it's got that to do item, hang up laundry. And so this time, if we do a deploy, oh, already installed, that's annoying. Uh, let's just say the idea is add two then. Okay, so that's worked. Now that item is still in the is still in the state because between the upgrades, we serialized it to stable memory, did the upgrade, then deserialized it back out of stable memory. Um, okay, let's do another another thing that's worth knowing about is initialization. So initialization will only run the first time a canister is installed um 
between upgrades, it doesn't run initialization. It only runs the pre-upgrade and post-upgrade. Um, actually, to be honest, in our case, there is nothing to initialize. Let, let's, um, it, it's good to be aware of this, though, but I'm not going to add anything in this example. Um, OK, one thing that is useful to know, useful is, is a nice way of doing things anyway, is to have an environment trait. And to save a bit of time, I'm just going to copy one I made earlier and talk through it rather than build it all myself. And you can find this code on the link I posted earlier um, to the repo. And so what this environment trait does is it allows you to query your environment at runtime. So you can get the time. And I quite like using type aliases just to clarify things. So you could put the timestamp as a U64, but then you don't know if that is the number of seconds or milliseconds or nanoseconds, whatever. So it's nice to put timestamp millis um, just so it's really explicit. And this allows you to query your environment, but if you tie it, if you can get all of this stuff while using the Rust CDK, but if in your code you rely on the Rust CDK, then you can't test it because the Rust CDK only allows you to run those queries um, if you're running within the context of a canister. And if you're just testing something locally, you can't use the Rust CDK. So by using this trait, you can abstract that away. And so when you're running in a canister, let's just remove this random thing because that just adds unneeded complexity for this example. Um, Although if you want to generate random numbers, it is useful to look at that in the repo I posted, but I don't think we're going to have time to talk through that now. Um, so what this exposes is the time now, the person making the call, the principle of them, and also the canister ID that we're cu currently running in. And it's got two implementations, one for when you're in a canister and one for when you're testing. And so when you're testing, you can hard code these to whatever you want so that in your tests, you can specify different you can kind of set up the environment differently, however you want. Um, and you'll also see I did implement this empty env purely so that you'll see here. Um, the reason that I had to have an empty environment is because we're going to need to implement default. So we can no longer derive default because this is a trait. And so a trait has no implementation on its own. So what we're going to need to do is we're going to say implement default for runtime state. And the reason it's nice to implement default for this is so that you don't have to wrap it in an option up here. If you, it's not the end of the world if you do have to um, wrap this in an option. It just means every time you use it, you have to call unwrap. And so it, it's nicer if you can avoid it to just implement default. So in here, we need to return runtime state. And for the environment, let's just put a box new. And also the reason it has to be in a box is because it with Rust at compile time, the compiler needs to know the size of every struct. And because this is a trait, a trait could be implemented by any any size struct, but by putting it in a box, um, this struct that it's compiling, it knows that the env field is just the size of a box, which is just the size of a pointer. So, and then data is data default. Okay. So now on a to do we can have like date added time stamp let's define let's define a type alias time stamp millis and then go back and fix your typos so this is a time stamp millis and so now when we generate it Uh, in post upgrade. Okay, so ah, 
now we we are going to need to use initialization because in the initialize we're going to need to initialize that environment so what we can do is we can let env equal box new but in this time it will be a canister environment new that'll do uh let data equal data default and then we just do that same thing so when we in, when we initialize the service we define this canister environment we def default our data and then we set the global runtime state um object to be equal to the one we've just created and we need to do the same down here okay so now when we add an item what we can do is we can set the date added to be runtime state env dot now and uh i'll show you now let's let's try and get some testing done so what we can do is um define config test by putting your test within config test it means that at compile time this code will only be included if you run it with the configuration set to tests so it's just a nice way of not bloating your code uh, that you're going to be pushing to the canister so in here, let's just test um, uh, add, then get. So in order to call add, we're not going to test, where is it? We're not going to test this method, the publicly available one. Instead, what we're going to test is this, the implementation of it, where all of the logic lives. And that's why it's good to split between what you're exposing to the outside world and then all of your inner logic. If you split it so that all of your inner logic is in a separate pure function where it just takes your arguments and returns some values, then it's really easy to test all of your core logic. And so you can still essentially test everything without, um, you, you don't really need to cover these methods because they're so small and simple that you're okay if you're just covering all of the core logic because you can't really test this without setting up all of the canister because it, it needs this global state and everything it's just a bit it's not it's not very nice for testing so in here we need to first define our runtime state equals runtime state and for the env in this case we're not going to use what we're using in the initialization because this one depends on the environment that the canister provides so it will use the rust cdk to get the time from the canister or the caller from the canister and so on in our case in fact let's simplify this we only need now we don't need the caller and the canister id So if we go back to the test, so env is box new test env. And actually, when you're doing tests like this, it's often nice to say use super star. And what that does is it will just import all of the references that are being used in the parent module. So test env, and we can just say now uh, equals Hold on. Ah, this isn't imported. Okay. And then data is data default. And so let ID equal, we want to call the add implementation. And let's say the name is let name equal uh, abc 
to string. And so in here, we'll want to say ABC and runtime state. And that's not going to be happy because this needs to be mutable. So what this will be doing is it will call into the function here, which will hopefully, if the test works, will add an item. But then let's say um, result equals get implementation runtime state. And this time it just takes a reference results, uh, I guess, because this returns a vec. And so what we can do is we can assert equals results length one, because there should be one result. So then we can say result equals results dot first unwrap, because we know that there's one. And so then we can say assert equals result ID. <clears throat> well, what do we want the ID to be? Um, in our case, I guess we don't really care about what the ID is in the test. The test, we don't really need to care about the ID, but we do need to care about the name. The ID could be anything. Um, so the name should match name and result date added should match the time and the time we put is one. And result, whoops, done should be false. In fact, so in this case, we can just say assert not done. And in Rust, we've passed the name into here. And so we can't reuse it there. So we're going to need to clone the, the name that we pass into the function. And then to tell it that this is a test, we just put the test attribute on it and let's see if our stuff works. We do have someone in the uh, chat saying that um, that they're perceiving all of this to be very fast. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I guess I'm trying to get through it in the hour. So um, yeah, I have kind of been racing a bit. Um, let's try that again. Build failed. Oh no, he um, he meant the compilation. Oh, cool. Well, <laughs> a bit of, a bit of both. A bit, yeah. Cool. <laughs> okay. Well, the tests all passed, so that is generally good. And um, I'll show you the debugging. So what you can do is you can debug a test, and now you can just step over line by line. So we could go into add implementation and then we can step through here so yeah it, this is quite nice um a, a nice thing that is exposed by using c lion i don't know if you can do that in visual studio code i haven't used it much i'm i'm kind of from a c sharp background and i always used um rider for c sharp which is another jetbrains ide and so it just felt quite natural for me when I swapped to using Sea Lion. Plus, I was already paying for Rider, and so Sea Lion was included in the same package I was already on, so that as well. Um, yeah, so that's debugging. Uh, I think, you know, I could do more, as in there's stuff we can do like markers done, but I don't think it really adds anything on top of what we've already gone through. I think it's fairly obvious, it's a fairly obvious step given that we've seen how to do updates and queries here. Um, any last questions? Because there's not that much time left. So Hamish, I know that open chat is not yet um, open sourced, uh, which yeah. it will be something you mentioned. But are there any other like comprehensive examples of uh, dApps that are built in Rust that maybe some of the students could refer to? Um, Yes. So there are some other ones that, because obviously this example we've built here is really basic. It doesn't deal with anything like inter-canister calls and asynchronicity. 
Um, but there is this one, if I can find it, uh, I'll pull this over so it's not just me clicking on another screen, no one can see it. Um, it's called ICP notifications. Yeah, so this one is a bit more complex. So if you want slightly more advanced um, canister, you can look there. Um, can you talk about UI? Not really, um, but there will be a talk about building UIs from one of the other devs, one of the other open chat devs um, next week. Is it next That's week? That's correct. I think so it's next week. The open chat yeah. front end developers who's very experienced. His name is Julian Jelps. He'll be running a workshop next Monday. I'll post the registration link in the chat. Yeah. Um, yeah, so how to integrate Rust with front end. Yeah, I think just watch that video uh, stream because essentially what we've done by building this canister is that we've just exposed some methods that you can either call via DFX canister call and then we can see them in the terminal or someone can build a front end which would make those calls but it's it's hitting it's hitting those same methods you know the back end doesn't care if you're hitting it from a browser or from the terminal um yeah any more for any more I just wanted to give the student uh, participants here a reminder that if you do have questions, there are a couple of avenues that you can reach out on. So ENCODE has a Discord. Um, Definity developers have their own Discord. Um, and that link has been circulated to you via email, but I'm also happy to drop it in the chat. We also have a developer forum where you can ask questions. Um, it's at forum.definity.org. And of course, you can always email me at liz at definity.org, or you can DM me on Discord, and I'm happy to get you sorted out. So um, it's really exciting that so many of you are interested in building on the, on the internet computer. I appreciate all of the great questions that you've been bringing up on this workshop, and definitely looking forward to hearing um, what your other questions are and what you guys end up building. Um, maybe a, a bit of a cheeky plug, but if anyone wants to message me, you can message me on open chat usernames hamish um don't be too surprised if things aren't that great on the um currently live version the v2 one will be much better i promise um but yeah you can message me there as well awesome. happy well, to answer any questions thank you so much hamish for your time on this workshop thank you to the encode club organizers and looking forward to hearing from you all soon i'll pass it back to the encode club organizers if you have any closing words should i stop <laughs> sharing yeah Thanks. Thank you so much, Hamish, for the great presentation. And thanks to Liz for handling all the chat questions so quickly. And so it's in such a great way. So one more thing, if you have any additional questions, there is a special office hour session this upcoming Wednesday with Hamish and Karsten. So make sure to sign up for that through our Eventbrite, but we'll also be sharing it through email and on our Discord and Twitter channels. So keep an eye out for that. Uh, have a nice weekend, everyone. Hope you learned a lot about Rust, as we have seen you're very enthusiastic about it in the chat. Um, built some nice hackathon projects, and we're looking forward to seeing you at the upcoming Internet Hackathon events. See you guys. Have a nice weekend, and thanks to everyone who showed up. Bye. Bye.